So, hey folks, uh, my name is George. As previously introduced, I'll be talking about the, what's on the screen right now. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is George, and I've been work a software engineer at Meta uh, since 2020. Uh, it's a little over four years now. During my time, I've worked on a few teams at the company. First, like a services testing team that like managed platform between integration tests. And now I'm on Accelerator User Space, which, as the name implies, might have something to do with Accelerator drivers. I'm currently based out of New York, and I'm originally from Canada. So to kick things off, let's look at a graph. Now, some of you might look at this graph and immediately know what it is. Uh, but for those of you that, that don't recognize it, it's pretty much a proxy for the AI hype cycle. Now, the stage was actually set a few years ago when Meta announced a program that it would make accelerators in-house for AI workloads. The schematic for the chip is pictured here. It's pretty complicated, and it just really describes an embedded device with a bunch of parallelism, uh, which is great for doing AI stuff, right? I won't be talking about the details of the chip itself, so here's a picture of one of our teammates holding the chip. Um, instead, I'll be talking about some of the software stack. Now, because we're building the chip from scratch, everything is vertically integrated, which means that starting all the way from the top with like PyTorch and you know, the application, uh, moving into libraries for ML, uh, the runtimes, and all the way down to the drivers and firmware. In this presentation, I'll be focusing on that little thing right there, just above the firmware. Uh, and for context, like the firmware driver was originally written as a kernel driver, and that worked for a while. Um, but clearly, the basis for this whole presentation is the fact that we realize we need to put this thing into user space. So today's talk is for those of you who might be thinking about migrating a driver to user space. And I'll be telling the story about like, uh, why we did it, like how we got there, and the challenges we faced along the way, and then also on like, where we ended up. So you might be thinking, if the driver ain't broke, why fix it? Well, to answer that question, we first need to understand what the driver is, uh, then why it doesn't work for our use case, and then finally, what we did instead. So to get an understanding of what the driver does, you can think of it as a PCIe driver. And fun fact, it's actually loosely based on the NVMe uh, driver. At its core, uh, the driver shuttles data between the host and the device. Simple. The device does some work, tells the host it's done, and then the host continues with that data. To limit the amount of copying done between the host and the device, memory is mapped over bars. Uh, and the device can work with a section of like RAM, for example, without involving the CPU at all using DMAs. Since all the translation between the virtual address and the physical address is, ha is happening in the driver, we also need to explicitly tell the application to pin memory uh, to make sure that like, things don't get shuffled around in the middle of like, an operation. The driver also translates low-level interrupts uh, into something more usable, like event of these, and it also handles stuff like queuing for packets and submissions. Um, it also exposes, uh, sorry, um, the, uh, it, the, the driver is also used to flash the firmware. Uh, to the various chiplets on the device, and it exposes an interface uh, for things higher in the stack to call. So, like stuff like listing devices, opening closing devices, and you know, uh, performing DMA, which is done by allocating, posting, and reading metadata, whatever. Um, so, why does the kernel driver make a set? So, for one, the rollout process is very long and very painful uh, because a rollout involves you know uh, change the kernel, which means you have to drain the host. This can be challenging because. Like, the kernel driver interacts a lot with user applications directly. The rollout itself can take up to a month, and just based on you know, the size of the fleet and various edge cases uh, that might come up during the rollout. It's also hard to debug issues in prod, because filtering signal from noise is challenging when you're looking at dmessage logs, and not to mention business logic and needs change all the time, uh, and there can be weird interactions at the kernel driver level. Um, we also have a lot of, oh, sorry, we also don't have that much deployment confidence because the best testing strategy is a stage rollout where we roll some hosts out and then check the, like, the metrics and then continue one by one and monitor for failures. This is a lot of overhead uh, given the amount of changes that the stack sees. And lastly, it's pretty hard to hire like, you know, skilled kernel developers just compared to a general average uh, full stack software developer. So what's the alternative, you might ask? Well, I'm glad you asked, because we think the right answer is shoving it into user space. Uh, to address the problems that I just mentioned, we thought it'd be cool to split the driver into three distinct pieces of software. So something fundamentally has to exist in kernel space to deal with the I.O. mappings. So we thought, hey, why not just use something that's already in tree? And that thing exists. It's called VFIO, uh, Virtual Function I.O. It's, it's a kernel submodule. As for the rest of user space, we thought that for stuff that deals with early boot and firmware and flashing, uh, a persistent host driver might make sense. We'll deploy this with systemd. You know, that thing that like, uh, 
runs, runs on the host. And for stuff that has more business logic, uh, like handling device firmware versions, uh, we can make another driver that's deployed with the application. And so as a result, we've kind of split one driver into three parts, with each layer being able to evolve more quickly and more freely than the one below it. So you, uh, that's all fun and games, and you know, software migrations can never go wrong, right? Especially for low-level components. So realistically, we, we ran into a few challenges, like uh, in no particular order, broken down, there are like, some requirements changes, language choice, operations, performance, user experience, and overall deprecation challenges. So the first challenge, uh, was getting everything to be user space driver compatible. Uh, this meant updating a bunch of call states to start pinning memory, since the kernel driver did this implicitly. Remember that if you don't pin the memory, the virtual address might not point to the same physical address in the future, and this was a breaking incompatibility, and the long tail of applications ended up being quite long. Some more self inflicted wounds include the fact that the implementation of VFIO doesn't really work with some assumptions with the rest of meta infra, where stuff like minor numbers and IO MMU groups are assumed to be static. Um, also, the kernel driver originally exposed the device using ordinals, because uh, that's what, like, what showed up in the, uh, 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 the dev node file system. But uh, that is ambiguous, and so we decided to piggyback on the overall migration to use BDF ID identifiers instead. It's not hard, it's just annoying. And then on the flip side, the usage of VFIO, the submodule, also meant that a bunch of hosts also needed to be configured uh, to use it. Uh, and, and so this meant we needed to uh, like enable the VFIO submodule, configure it to use like the right vendor ID, enable IOMMU since that's a crucial part of the system, uh, fiddle around with UFE to enable ACS, really disable the redirects. And in theory, this all sounds simple until you apply it to a fleet of non-homogeneous servers. Um, and so speaking of piggybacking, um, we thought that since we were re rewriting the thing from scratch, let's use Rust to make the compiler and the type system catch uh, all the errors and do all the heavy lifting when it comes to reasoning about uh, type safety and, and concurrency. So instead of writing the thing again in C, we used Rust, and we didn't really have a ton of experts on the team going into the project. The language is also relatively new at the company, uh, so the language support and in internal tools was a, a little bit lacking. And this might be the biggest zinger, but we actually needed to use unsafe for most of the stuff that operated with the memory that we got back from the firmware. But we ended up in a state where the unsafe usage was like uh, condensed into a much smaller surface, and like the rest of the driver was still able to use all the good stuff about Rust. Oh yeah, and all the layers of the stack, both below and above the driver, are like seed-based, so we had to use FFI and Bindgen for that stuff. So before the kernel driver followed a pretty standard and previously described, previously described painful process uh, for deployment, and piggybacking seems to be a common theme here. So we decided to uh, use a brand new deployment imaging system for our prod deployment and work through all the rough edges related to that. Uh, for the rest of the dev fleet, we, decided <clears throat> we still use Chef, but this comes with an asterisk. Typically, developers want to run their own version of the driver um, on their machine that they're working on, right? This means that users will start and stop that driver, and the machine might not, might not even have a driver running at any given point. Now imagine. There's another piece of infra that pings the driver to see if the device is alive, and the driver's not there. Right, it's a problem. So you, you, you get the point. So fundamentally, right, like only one thing can claim a device with VFIO, so we had to like, make some nasty workarounds to like, deal with this um, part. Moving on to perf, an important metric to the success of a driver is also performance, right? The first graph here actually shows that for a normal workload, the driver actually lowers the variance that we see in latency, which is um, great uh, at higher percentiles. However, uh, we started running into issues at the IPC layer. Being at Meta, we naively started with Thrift because it's a great like, data modeling language, but that has way too much overhead uh, for a low-level driver, so we went with Dbus instead. Shout out to the Zbus Rust crate. <laughs> um, we chose Dbus because we wanted something that was battle tested and like had a low overhead. But it turns out the Dbus overhead wasn't low enough. Uh, for small size DMAs like 32 bytes or you know that, like uh, the overhead of the Dbus IBC call uh, dominated the latency, meaning that like uh, we were seeing around 5x slower latencies with our user space driver compared to the old kernel driver. So bypassing the driver for the hot path and moving all the DMA calls into a library. Uh, got us back down to numbers that approximate the kernel driver, which is great news, and also even beat some of the performance numbers for the kernel driver um, for the small batch DMAs. 
So moving on to more problems, the most tricky of which is users. Uh, users got used to expecting their host to just work because that's what life was like, right, if the kernel driver was deployed correctly. Uh, this spawned the need for better user tooling. Um, uh, because we want to help out users when they like, uh, got a new machine and wanted to install the, the driver. Enter uh, MTIA control, which uh, MTIA stands for the Meta Training Inference Accelerator. Um, and control like, shamelessly rhymes with the system D equivalent because like, who would have thought that a daemon of daemons could be a powerful concept. Um, one caveat is that most of our end users don't know how to interact with system D. So we had to package it up into a nice little binary that you just can build off their local revision run some environment checks on the system, because remember, all the configuration stuff we had to deal with earlier, and then manage the host and container drivers in the background. This was built to solve the versioning problems of not having an explicit versioning scheme, uh, coupled with the fact that Dbus doesn't handle versioning very well, if you've ever used that. So fully uh, deprecating a driver is pretty hard. There are a lot of static references, but also user workflows that, like, and, like uh, muscle memory that needs to be retrained. Uh, and pair this with the fact that the code base is worked on by hundreds of developers. You, you get a bunch of CI running on various platforms that now need to be supported. The platforms include simulation and emulation environments, and this explodes the cardinality of you know, things that need to be checked out for, um, on migration. So uh, was it worth it? After hearing about all the horrors, you might think, uh, like, why would I even go through the trouble? Right? But I'd say that it, w it was, given that the performance and the deployment and the DevX wins uh, we had outweighed the, uh, the, the, the pain. So the most objective win is the throughput that the driver had once we worked through all the I IPC issues. The kernel driver throughput is shown as the blue line, while the red line is before the bypass and the yellow line is after. And we, it, it clearly shows a win at every single level of like batch size for no ops. The deployment cadence also greatly benefited because now we can deploy a new version of, of the driver in approximately three hours with pretty good confidence that it reached all the hosts. Um, when it used to take on the order of months. On the container side, the driver deploys with every version of, of the application, which is great because software changes can be applied uh, atomically in, in those parts. And uh, like the, uh, uh, um, this enables us to work uh, with an implicit commit hash based versioning sc uh, scheme f uh, for the most part. All of this aligns with um, the core company value, which is to move fast and build and learn faster than anybody else. And so lastly, despite the challenges on the UX side, I'd wager that the overall DevX improved uh, with the migration to the user space driver. Because now debugging incidents is easier, given the split of the responsibilities of each component. Um, and the fact that the driver is in user space, which lets us leverage a bunch of tooling that already exists for that. The choice of language also played a big role in DevX. Uh, since now every change mo moving forward has at least some level of baseline confidence that you know the compiler and the Rust uh, the, uh, that Rust offers, and all the tooling we had uh, to build to get parity with the kernel also improved uh, the overall experience because now it's like a single entry point for all users, which makes it easier for both users and us who maintain the driver. Uh, so, thanks for listening to the story about how we migrated from the kernel space to user space. And specifically, like uh, why we found the kernel driver to be burdensome, the challenges that we had uh, of putting this thing in user space, and the outcomes we were able to see. Uh, any questions? Thank you for this cool talk. Um, hi, um, Zebas guy here. <laughs> so, um, you mentioned performance problems uh, and latency issues with the with mm -hmm. Zebas. Um, actually, I um, have a new version coming, <laughs> and I have resolved a lot of the performance bottleneck as much as I could. Oh, nice. um, so uh, in some cases, you will notice even up to 95% reduction in, in you know, performance bottlenecks. Oh, so cool. um, yeah, it will be cool. <laughs> just, just nice. Might have to upgrade then. Thank you so much for the talk. Really excellent uh, story, success story, engineering success story. I wanted to ask you to reiterate on the user space with bypass. What is bypassing what? Oh, the bypass just meant instead of like using an IPC call to make the DMA, uh, we just make a library call that like uh, does that instead. Any more questions? It's there in the back. So taking this one example of a particular use case, uh, do you see any um, like reason why more users, more drivers should end up in user space? 
uh, or could, could be, was there any particular case where they shouldn't be uh, migrated from kernel to user space? Um, that's a great question. I think that um, obviously some parts need like, you know, pr uh, like certain pr privileges or read parts of memory, like, right, that's why we use v VFIO as, as a sub module. But <clears throat> in general, evolving something in user space is a lot easier than evolving something in kernel base, or at least we found that to be the case. I uh, guess uh, my, my question is more uh, probably painted by uh, GPU drivers. Uh, 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 like, uh, do you think any of the uh, like external vendors like uh, NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, et cetera, will, that, will look at this um, as possible path forward to actually doing uh, faster driver upgrades or possibly not having to integrate with the Linux kernel um, source code directly? Sorry, what, what's the question? Well, I guess the, uh, would, would they could they use this to uh, bypass the uh, requirement to integrate drivers upstream into the kernel as well, like basically license hack? Maybe that could be a possibility? Maybe. Okay. <laughs> My understanding is that the NVIDIA drivers for modern cars basically work like that, where they have a very large firmware blob that does magical things on the card, they have a shim kernel driver, and then a lot of the actual business stuff is in user space. Okay. More questions? Going once, going twice, none? Okay, then let's thank our speaker again for the cool talk.